Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited to be joined by the wonderful Dominique Fishback to talk about her Apple TV Plus show, The Last Days of Ptolemy Gray. And I, I was really interested in the, the extensive document that you created for this character because you looked at both the script and the original source material of the book and really put together, you know, a 28 page kind of character breakdown images, you know, so it wasn't even just one piece of writing that you were putting together about some of the facets that you saw in the script but also elements in the book that you felt were really important to include. And I was really interested in hearing a little bit more about some of the specific details of what you put in there. And also just like how that really says a lot about the collaboration with Walter Mosley, who wrote the book and translated it for screen and like the collaboration that he had with you and the autonomy that you had over your character through being able to, you know, have these types of conversations. Yes. This is, yeah. To, to be honest, for me, psych, I think the way into any character that I've played has been psychological, emotional and psychological, but I love to journal as my characters. I've done it for so long. It just gives me such an insight. And then even if I don't remember everything that I wrote in these journals, it's in my subconscious mind. So, so the way I respond or react as a character to a question is not something that I've mapped out, but it's something that organically happens because I know this character inside out um but for this one every time I sat down to journal I couldn't I had so much resistance and I was like but I didn't want to force it and I wanted to also free my own self because I think I want to be aware and conscious of the fact that like if I know that journaling has worked in the past I don't want to feel like like I need it now like I can't trust my own instrument enough to like say okay that's not for this particular project or this character. So in doing that, I said, okay, well, Dom, don't force it. Like, accept where you are. And then I felt, how Robin, I felt that character saying, like, I don't know what you did with the rest of them girls, but I don't journal. And I'm like, all right, homegirl, then we're going to have to compromise, you know? And so the compromise for me was that I felt like I had this book with all of this material, but didn't really see, after the second episode, I didn't really see it so heavily in the script. And I was just thankful that they knew from the beginning what type of artist that I was and they wanted to hear. I didn't want to make a a PDF that was not going to be received well or really cared about. And um, so Walter and Sam and everybody was really excited about this PDF. So I read the script, I mean, I read the book and I started pulling my favorite quotes that represented Robin and Ptolemy's um, relationship the things that he said about her when she, when he wasn't speaking to her um, and just trying to figure out what her dreams were. I decided that I would use her name to kind of be like the segue into it. So I wrote her name on the document and then I described what it meant to me, which is that like, it reminds me of birds because Rob is a bird and they fly. And she has been through so much trauma in her life that just flying, flying across country wouldn't be far enough. So she had a dream of being like, like an astronaut where she could shoot up into space and find an ET and find her way home. And then before she could do that, she kind of finds her own extraterrestrial being with Ptolemy and the way his mind is working. He's on a different timeline and she's super intrigued by his thoughts and she does find home. So there's that. And then being able to say, okay, now that we know her dream, how can we sprinkle that in instead of having her on a cell phone in at the start of a, at at the start of a scene, Can we have her with an astronomy book? Can we do the things that show her in action of achieving a goal that even if we never see it happen, we know that she's actively working towards something. That was really important. I I got her to have a scar. That's not in the book, but really saying like, what is it about her that says don't mess with me before she even opens her mouth? It's like that show, not tell thing. You know, in the book, they have this relationship where it's kind of, a little bit more romantic and questionable in that way. And I knew that we weren't going to go in that direction for the show, but how could we sprinkle it in, in a way where somebody could be like, hmm, does she think she loves him like that? Or like, what is actually going on here? And I was like homage in my mind and in the PDF to when Natalie Portman in The Professional said, I think I'm falling in love with you, Leon. And like, he like spits out the milk, you know? And I just think that's so important empowering and special because who's to say that a kid or a teenager wouldn't know what love is mm-hmm. or to or, or believe or feel that they feel this way about a person mm-hmm. 
And I like, and I like that idea. Yeah. You know, and I also, I love the fact that she is a character that loves so fiercely and so defensively of him. Um, You know, we also get to see it through like developing romanticism, but she's obviously with everything that she's gone through and the trauma that she holds, even the physical scar that you were mentioning, you know, that's like a physical manifestation of everything inside that she sees every day. And within that, she's had to build certain guardrails around herself and she doesn't give herself freely right away. People have to earn it. And, and one of the things is there's more of kind of like a solemnness in her expression early on. And, you know, we get to see that really kind of like comedic side of her and and the humor and the lightness, but you never give it to another character straight away. And so I was interested in, in how you thought, not just about what are the specific guardrails that she's had to build out of necessity, out of survivalism, but what is it that breaks those down for her? What, what's the moment where she trusts someone enough to show that other side? You know, um, I think it's different. I think it's different for, everybody I think when she first meets Ptolemy in the the first episode like at the funeral um well he's already being placed on her somebody else has already decided that she was going to be taking care of this old man and calling him her uncle and she's like he's not my uncle like yeah I don't know this man and I'm not just because he's old I'm not gonna you know try to be nice to him like that's not what first of all it's not written in the script like that the lines kind of allow you to know but I think for me it was more so I know Robin doesn't care about what people think about her, but I had to check my own self and say, you know what, Dom, you're not going to smile. Don't smile. Make sure that they earn it. You know, uh, I think we we live in a world where 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 the world expects a woman's smile, a black woman's smile, a black girl smile. And I just wouldn't give it to him unless it was earned. Mm-hmm. You know, even the scene. That's why I really like like the top of the scene with her and Roger come when she's coming out the store because she sees this little kid these little kid with this big old like curly hair and she's like looking at the kid and she starts smiling and as soon as that happens it's intercepted by a man who is saying like uh hey girl and she's like what you want like immediately and you know what he look like don't and he's like oh you name robin right and i ad-libbed this line if you knew my name was robin why are you calling me girl like it was a line that i was like i think she would say this it's not going to be so easy and i just wanted to honor that it wasn't going to be easy without fear of thinking that she would come off as mean or unlikable. That really wasn't my intention. I had to be like, no, she has guys talking to her in the street. She don't know him. She don't care how you feel about her. Mm-hmm. Like she doesn't care about none of it. And I had to like honor her. And she told me, you know, I felt inside she she reacted the way she wanted to react. Mm-hmm. I also, I love the way that she expresses herself and expresses her love because it's not about specifically saying those words out loud most of the time. It's little gestures or ways that she says other things. You know, when she's service is her love language. (laughs) Yeah. You know, like when she's first with Ptolemy and he's taking the medication and he's kind of thrashing around in the night and she's angry at him. She's like, I was scared you weren't going to wake up. And that's a beautiful way of saying, I love you. And I was concerned about you. Or even when, you know, she's going out with Roger in one of the later episodes and gets in the passenger seat and then leans across to the driver's seat to open the door for him. And so there's all these really beautiful, both dialogue and actions that she makes as a character. And so what did you kind of see her love language and, and the way that she would express it without saying it out loud to be? Uh, well, I mean, that's such a great descriptive, like a description of it. Like you probably took the words out of my mouth, but, um, yeah, that, that car, that car moment, I love it that they kept it in because it literally was just something that I did. And I was like, I love that moment in the Bronx tale. And I think she is a connoisseur of movies and, and things like that. And like, for me, I'm a romantic and, um, I don't know if people often see that unless they talk to me and I'm sure she has some romantic, some romance in her, but it's finally able to come out because she has somebody that she can trust. Um, and I think that her love language is acts of service and probably quality time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and you, you were mentioning before. I mean, sorry to cut you off, but I just had another thought. Maybe her, the way she gives love is acts of service and quality time. I think quality time is one of hers that she wants to receive but then maybe words of affirmation might be hers without knowing you know because she's like I'm the one you should be calling the devil and he's like you're not devil how you know how you know like you know she's looking for somebody to tell her that she's not all the things that the world has already told her that she was Mm -hmm. I really love that point that you're just saying about the way that she views herself because it's so different to 
to how, you know, Ptolemy suddenly sees her in the light that she is and sees all of these attributes that people have just overlooked in her for years. And it's really, really beautiful throughout the entire season to watch her go on this journey of seeing that in herself, you know, by the end, she very proudly owns all of these attributes and it really kind of shifts her self perspective. Did you kind of see it as there being specific turning points and shifts for her or that it was just a very gradual journey into herself that you were working towards building towards so that we have that version of her by the end? Yeah, I think in the past with the journaling and such, I would have been more hyper aware of that. But I really this was really an act of like trusting the process and um, just knowing that I was going to go moment by moment. So I didn't really extend to think, oh, well, she's not this way now, but I want her to be this way. I think it like, thankfully, naturally happened to where, like, in the beginning, how in this moment, how do I feel about this? I don't like this person. And I don't like what they did. So I don't like this doctor. And if I, Dominique, thinks about, oh, I have to make sure that she's smiling by the end, or she is warm by the end, then I'm not, I'm not being honest. You know, I, I, I like, so I'm really thankful. And I was more surprised as I watched the show back that, oh yeah, there is an arc where she does soften. Cause it obviously like there was points in my mind as, as I was shooting being like, I don't remember if I did it like this, like, is that going to be bad? It's going to come off one note. Like, you know, there's obviously those, there's those questions, but I had to say, you know, I'm just being real. Like in the moment, I'm going to be her in that moment. And however it comes off, you know, it's, it's the truth of who she is as, as expressed through me. Mm-hmm. I was like happy to see that. Oh, wow. It's, it's evident. Her, her change is evident because you see why she's able to soften. She didn't soften because it was written that she softened. Because in fact, she says, she says a lot of the same things. She just says it differently. Mm-hmm. She says a little warmer, a little more like she knows somebody hears her. She knows somebody cares about what she thinks. You know, and I think that's why she was so offended when he didn't get up and leave with her. That when the doctor was saying all that stuff and she was like, they don't care about you. Like we could leave right now. And now it's him, her and the doctor. And he's like, I'm not going to go with you. How betraying, how, how betrayed must she feel to be like, you did this outside and like not even with company. We don't know this person. You still chose. I've been doing all the stuff for you and with you. And I love you. And you chose somebody that don't care nothing about you over me even though it was not choosing him over her. That was just how I think she probably internalized it at the moment. Mm-hmm. And, and with that idea of really just trusting the process and, and it being very much about being there and finding the moment, I was interested in how that kind of transfers to the way that you and Samuel L. Jackson work together because it wasn't about building a history and a backstory between these two characters, which I was interested if that kind of allows a different type of freedom as scene partners to really just explore the moment and, and find the dynamic along the way, because you also get to kind of play to it in real time. I think the first scene that you filmed was that one at the funeral where he's really distressed and she's kind of like, how do I, what do I do? Do I comfort you? Do I not? I don't know this person, you know, and you kind of got to build that dynamic over time in, in actuality as you were kind of figuring each other out as scene partners as well. That, I mean, I think that was a cool part because I, I was also trying to figure out who she was that day as well. But I, I think because I was open to it, naturally, she was she started being like, mm, do I hug him? How do I hug him? Because like, that's not me. I'm very much a, a consoler type person. So I knew at that point that she was doing she was using me as, as she wanted to. And I was like, OK, all right, we're, we're getting somewhere. You did enough work before getting a set that allows a character to express herself through you. Um, yeah, with, with Sam, it was just, uh, I knew Miss, I knew Miss Latanya because I worked with her twice um, as his wife and um, didn't really know Sam like that. So I think that because the character, like you said, they didn't know each other. It was very um, easy to, to, to try to kind of feel that. And then as we got to know each other and like, each other's sense of humor and whatever. It just made sense. I'm just really thankful because I was able, I think because of where I come from, I I was able to tap into a Robin that is like, yeah, I don't care. I don't care that you don't want to throw this stuff away. We got to do it. No, yeah, we're going to do it. And like, they kind of going back and forth with each other. I'm not thinking about, oh, this is Samuel Jackson. I'm like, this is Robin with Ptolemy and this man cannot live like this anymore. And so we were really fed off of each other in that way. 
Mm -hmm. I also love that you've, you've said that the two of you had a lot of conversations that, that went outside of the craft and, and were very much also about the business aspect of being an actor, which, you know, is one of the things that isn't talked about as much and, and discussed. And there's so many things that you have to navigate and learn at every single stage of your career. And I was interested in what were some of the valuable tools that you took away from the conversations that you were able to have with him in regards to the business side of being an actor. Yeah. I said, well, one just about specifically how you, how not how you pick your projects, but just being specific when you, when you pick them, just also knowing that having a personal hair and makeup person is, is, is healthy. It's healthy for you to get those things because that's the way you protect your energy and you're able to give more of yourself to a character as opposed to all these people that's going to be needing something from you all day. When something is streamlined and going through one person, then it's, it's easier. You know, you're able to be yourself. If if I'm in a mood or whatever it is, because I'm human, at least this person close to me understands that and not is not going to get offended or what, you know, it's just, it's just easier. I think my, one of my biggest fears just in general is always the fear of like being misunderstood mm-hmm. and having my intentions be not like not received well or something like that. And it was something that I had to get over. So my birthday came uh, two days before I filmed the show and Sam got me as I am by Cicely Tyson. And by the end, I'm at navigating and through, throughout the whole process, the saying like, how, what does that really feel? How do I be myself? Be myself. I'm going to be myself no matter what. And that's what I what I did. And I think by the end, as I am, the thing he got me in the very beginning was a, was a lesson. I love that. And also, you know, speaking of external aspects of Robin as a character as well, you know, obviously there, there was a physical scar that we were talking about earlier, but you also had input on aspects of her hair, you know, down to the idea of like, what color is her expression, wanting it to be really bright and kind of landing on purple. Um, and so it's interested in kind of the external facets of her that were really important to you in terms of finding your performance and finding her as a character. Yeah, well, I definitely didn't get everything that I wanted, you know, on the PDF, because I gave her like, I gave her like nose rings and like tattoos um, and they didn't give me that, but I got the scar and that was the most important. So, um, but yes. And then also being able to decide what I wanted her to do with her hair. My little sister just turned 16 and she loves to color her hair like pinks and blues. And she's very um, spunky and sporty like that or punky like, and um, I never colored my hair. I've always been like, Mm-mm, I'm an actor. You have to stay like, which is not true, but that was something I had in my mind. And so to have this opportunity to express myself and say, well, the teenagers do like to color their hair a lot. Um, Didi, uh, Didi Megsger, she's the hair person on the show. And she was like, well, I said teal. And she was like, well, what about purple? And we kind of found our way to like purple. Mm-hmm. I also wanted to talk a little bit about the kind of like shift in what drives her. You were talking early on about, you know, always wanting to have the emotional facet and for the audience to really understand what emotionally drives her. Yeah. But she's also a character that has certain survivalism instincts. You know, we see that when she's at Nisi's house and the fact that she's sleeping with a knife under the pillow. And then we get to, it feels like there's a shift between certain actions that come from survivalism. And then she's allowed to allow herself to kind of lead with emotion in a different way. Um, and so I was interested in how you saw those two facets of, of the way that certain actions in her next character are motivated. Um, well, I, I mean, the, I guess the first thing that came to my mind when you, when you asked this just now is like, uh, her relationship with Hilly, the one who, you know, uh, kind of tries to assault her in the, in the beginning. I think that when we see her go to pick up her stuff in episode three and he comes out and he's getting in her face and then Billy kind of is like about to get into his face and like fighting. She said, is he, it ain't even worth it. That's when I said, oh, okay, there's a, she's changing. You know, like I didn't have to map anything out. It was in the words. So thankfully to, to Walter for that. But Um, But yeah, just kind of that's what I'm saying is the idea of being present was really the gift because it allowed all of the emotions that she was to experience to be true, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. 
It does absolutely, and and also talking a little bit about you know her her relationship with her mother. There's you know so much beautiful complexity in that. You know she talks later on about she always knew that her mom loved her, but her mom clearly just wasn't able to show up for her in the right way in a lot of regards. And and I know that the scene where she talks to Ptolemy about it was again one of the things that you really advocated for being in the scripts. Yeah. And it also feels like it's the first time that she's kind of admitted to anybody that she feels like she didn't show up for her mom in the right way and that she wished that she could have died. And there's a lot of complexity in, in becoming a caretaker for anyone that she probably goes through with Ptolemy as well, where there's days where she knows that she's done a great job and she feels like she's really shown up and there's days that she probably feels like she could do more. And so I was really interested in all of the complexity that that allowed you to build into her as a character and really looking at what that relationship was with her mom. And then some of the parallels that start to come to the surface for her emotionally through kind of becoming a caretaker for Ptolemy in a different way. Yeah, um, I think, well, for one, I just couldn't get with the idea that she had cleaned his house because she needed somewhere to stay. And that was kind of like, oh, she did it because for survival, for physical. So I said, no, I don't think that's true. And it's not gonna motivate, it's not gonna motivate me. And then reading that line in the novel and book, how could it not be in a show? This is like injury into everything that she is. And so I, once I advocated for that and, and knew that that was even a truth, then her cleaning the bathtub and the toilet and doing all that stuff on her hands and knees for this man she didn't know was a, was a great motivation factor. And I think, I think, yeah, of course, there's probably the days where she felt like she did a good job and other days where she felt like, why am I doing this for this person? I didn't do it for my mom, you know, or I fell short for my mom. And now I'm, you know, and maybe that's also the guilt about the money. Like there, there's so many things that we can't even begin to understand that's going on in her, in her mind. But um, yeah, I was just definitely glad for that line because I just wanted to make sure although it's called the last days of Ptolemy Gray, she's very important to the story and her truth and her emotions and her world is equally as important. And getting an opportunity for her to express that with him was really, really important to me. Yeah. And, and going back a little to, to the thing you were talking about earlier in terms of the line that you were ad-libbing where she's like, you know, you know my name, so why are you calling me girl? Um, what were some of the other moments that you really remember where you had that opportunity of discovery on set in the middle of production, in the middle of scenes, where it was either a line or a particular action that you made within a scene that really just came from, you know, everything you were talking about with the journaling and how that just allows yeah. you to find things in the moment. Yeah, well, the the I think one that comes to mind is when uh, she when she's first cleaning up Tolly's house and she's showing him the things, and she's like, "Do you want this funky old toothbrush?" And I go <laughs> like, like it, like it's attacking him. That was just something that came out of like me, like just doing it, you know. And then uh, one of the scenes that was added, the conversation was added was because I just could not like. Uh, so she gets the guy Roger. And now we see him. And the first time we see him, we, we're knowing exactly what's, what he wants to do with his life. We know that he's in school, that he's into art design and get video games. And Ptolemy is asking him all his questions about what he wants to do. And me, I was like, we cannot have, Robin has been here for four episodes and we still have never heard it, what it is that she cares about and that she wants for her life. Like we cannot have this guy come in and like get this whole backstory that we haven't gotten for Robin. And uh, I was so glad that they they um, heard me. And then it kind of ended up being like a literally a line that I said or something like that, like in a, in a different way. But like Robin's like, well, you ain't never asked me nothing like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I was like, because he ain't never asked her nothing like that. You know, like so um, that that was some of the things. And I just wanted to make sure that that we, I was being true to not only uh, the Robin in the book, but also teenagers. You know, and and so and like there's one line where uh, where Ptolemy is like, oh, he wants a, he wants us to get a car to go do something. And Robin's on the phone and she like she kind of just stops eating her food and just gets up and says the car will be here in 20 minutes. Be ready. Like what an attitude out of nowhere. And then he goes, like, um, Sam goes like, what the hell happened or something like that. And like some people might not understand, like, you know, but that a lot of times with teenagers, that's how it be. you don't even know what you said that got them so dang mad you know so I was like let me honor like she don't want him to get hurt she don't want that's the main her main objective is to protect this person now how she expresses it maybe you don't maybe somebody won't understand 
you know, or think she might be being mean to somebody or something, but she don't feel like that, you know? Yeah. And with her relationship with Roger, you know, it's, it's such a great space to get to see all these different sides of her as a character, like we were talking about before. And, you know, at the beginning, it's obviously she likes him and there's a flirtation. And then there's that development into like kind of both of them realizing like this is actually potentially something real, you know, even down to the fact where he says it out loud and, her, you know, going back to her love language, her, her response is like, you're stupid, but we know exactly what she means in saying that, um, you know, and, and how did you kind of view that relationship? And, and for you, what was the moment for her where she suddenly was like, this is someone who's showing up for me in the right way. And this is something that could really be something for me. Uh, I think the moment she realized it is when she also tells Ptolemy that she loves him. I think it's that like late night conversation that they have where she's like, um, uh, that he's like, does he treat you good? And she says, yes. Right. And she says it with such conviction and she's like, honestly able to answer that question and know that nobody in her life has ever done that. I don't know. But for me, I didn't feel like they were going to be together for a really long time. I don't know. I just felt like maybe it was a transitional thing or like, you know, a manifestation. They say we like, we um, get back what we put out. And so for so long, she's been getting hurt and probably not realizing that she's been perpetuating it just by her way of thinking or her, her energy or whatever it is. And now she's in a place where she can be safe and soft and open and still be herself and still be that protecting energy, but have that balance. And now with, with Ptolemy, and now she's quickly manifested that in, in reality. Now, whether or not they're going to be together forever is like kind of beside the point because all of it, all of it, all it is, is experience and relationships to learn what, what you have to heal and what you want to keep, keep with you. Yeah. And with that scene where she does tell Ptolemy that she loves him, it's, it's such a beautiful scene in so many ways, but also because they both express themselves in their own way and with their own dynamic and the humor is still there. You know, they kind of like, they lean into it fully emotionally, but then they're also kind of, there's the comedic aspect in that scene as well. And so what was the journey of really figuring out exactly what that scene needed to be emotionally for Robin as a character? Um, I, like, honestly, it was all just being present in the moment. I think a lot of it too was, even if, even if somebody around didn't understand my choices as an actor or something like that, or like if the can't, what the camera was going to pick up and things like that. For me, it's like when he brings up Cynthia, she's like, you know, there's a little, like, so of course you did this for Cynthia. Okay. You got this big old painting in your room with Cynthia. Everything is Cynthia. Like, you know, like, you know, and like, even though she never says it out loud, that's how I felt that she felt. And so when she brought up this name, so when she asked him, like, you ever felt like that for somebody? He says, Ma, and then he says, and you know how I felt about Cynthia. And I'm like, you know, like, everyone knows how you feel about Cynthia. Ugh. You know, so she is a little jealous of this, like, past, like his passed on wife. Like, um, but then being, but then he says, but you're the only, you're the only woman who ever loved me without condition or like unconditional. And he doesn't know the word and she has to finish it. And she feels good about that because she knows that she had given him all the love that she could possibly give. And he also calls her a woman and she's 17, you know, so he's seeing her for like not an age that people think. And also I was learning about twin flames at the time. I don't know if you ever heard of them, but there is something where they say like, sometimes they can, like, it can be in a huge age gap, you know? between them and it's it's in a significant age gap but but twin flames all about unconditional love so I feel like they might have been twin flames I love that well it's it's such a stunning performance throughout the series and you know so many amazing two-hander scenes between the two of you as well and it's been really amazing to watch the series so thank you so much Dominique really appreciate this conversation of course and thank you for taking the time I love it thanks